Aloha. I'm Joshua Cooper, your host, and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. Today, we'll be looking at Ukraine in the United Nations, the human right of self-determination, and UN reform. I'm so honored to be joined by the Consul General in San Francisco. Dimitri, thank you so much for making time. Hello, Josh. Thank you very much for having me. We'll be looking at the United Nations, which is commemorating its creation in San Francisco and its promise of the right to self-determination for all peoples on the planet. On the 77th anniversary of the UN Charter, it enshrined human rights for all people everywhere on Earth. And Ukraine is demanding its right to self-determination, but more importantly, reform of the UN to make sure all people have their rights. Ukraine is demanding reform so all people can live in a rule of law-based order rooted in human rights. And today, we're actually recording live from the Palais in Geneva, Switzerland, where the League of Nations was created in the early 20th century. And Ukrainian people have been demanding their basic fundamental freedoms and core human rights since then, and were there at the founding in San Francisco in 1945. Dimitri, thank you so much. And maybe you could share with us a bit about the right of self-determination for the Ukrainian people then and today. Uh, hello again. So shall we, you, you want to start with the United Nations thing or you want to start even earlier? We, we can begin where you desire. I know we can look at the League of Nations. So many people, yeah. when they look at the right of self-determination for Ukrainian people, the exciting part was Woodrow Wilson demanded the right of self-determination in the League of Nations Charter, the precursor to the UN. So I know the Ukrainian National Republic had participated even back in 1918, 19, and 1920. Maybe you can share a, a bit about that. Yeah, so, so I, I would probably uh, start even uh, saying that when this war, uh, the Russia started against Ukraine right now, the Armenian people, uh, while I was meeting with them, asked, uh, what's the historic context? What is it about? Why, why Russia attacked Ukraine? And uh, so because Russia was trying to explain to the world that Ukraine has always been a part of Russia. And apparently that was not true, never. And uh, probably you know that Ukraine was founded as a country, as the, as the city of Kiev was founded like many, many hundred years ago before Russia. And uh, so like Kiev is 1,500 years old and Moscow is only 800 years old. And that's why historically we've always been different and it existed before. And then it's all continued during centuries, centuries. And then uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was the second, first world war and uh, the revolution, so a revolution in uh, Russia, uh, where the communists basically have taken power and uh, got rid of the emperor, the tsar, and killed him eventually. And Ukraine used that situation to uh, start another round of fighting for the independence. And that's when uh, Ukraine People's Republic was created in 1970. And uh, later, the West Ukrainian People's Republic was created, and then they united together and denounced uh, the, the joint, uh, joint Ukraine. And uh, when that happened, Ukraine, Ukrainian delegation to the League of Nations uh, uh, tried to get the uh, kind of approval or kind of confirmation from the League of Nations so the Ukraine would be recognized uh, as, the, as, the, as the country after the uh, Paris uh, negotiations, which were taken after the Second World War. And uh, at that time, we had actually resistance from the Western part of Ukraine. Western Ukraine had resistance from Poland, to be honest. And that's exactly opposite from what's happening today. Because right now, today, since Russia started the war against Ukraine this year, the Poland is our biggest ally. And as it was said, all the historical differences which existed between our nations in the before have just stopped to exist because there is such a unity between the Ukrainian people and the Polish people right now that, I don't know, it never existed before. But you know that time, what happened in history was a little bit different. And at that time, different Polish government uh, wanted to have control over some Ukrainian territories because they understood that if they don't, then Russia would take the all, all Ukraine. And uh, unfortunately, at that time, the League of Nations was not, uh, I don't know, strong enough or uh, the organization did not work as it as needed. And uh, it happened 
for a long time by all the efforts and the um, attempts of Ukraine to get confirmation of its independence or at least the, the uh, and the subject of international law and order to be recognized by the League of Nations is failed. And uh, you know that eventually the League of Nations failed itself because the main purpose of establishing the League of Nations was to preserve peace and territorial integrity of countries of Europe. And even at that time, uh, one of the uh, diplomatic notes which Ukrainian delegation sent uh, to the League of Nations was that uh, Soviet Russia is attacking Ukraine, is killing its citizens, and we need protection. So basically the same thing was happening 100, 100 years from, uh, from that time right now. And again, the League of Nations was not having enough power to, to do anything about it. And then if, eventually, uh, Russia has captured the to Ukraine and Ukrainian, and, and in, in kind of included Ukraine as an as a autonomous republic in the big Soviet Union. And then Ukraine, uh, after the Second World War, <clears throat> joined the, uh, the United Nations as a kind of a, a separate founding member in 1945. Uh, so it was the Russian. Soviet Republic, Ukrainian, uh, and uh, the Belarus at that time. Um, so that's how that's how it is, and that's the historic context which connect uh, the events 100 years before to the war um, right now. Oh, that's an excellent historical context for people to understand because exactly what Russia was trying to claim about being part all the time is ignoring that history. And I think what you also brought up regarding League of Nations was one, it was interesting that in 1919, 1920, it was regarding violations in Poland, but now Russia's actions have united you. But the other big issue that gives a historical context before going to San Francisco, where you're now based, is that aspect of the Holodomor and that starvation to inflict death, where another totalitarian leader of Russia tried to run over and caused at least 3.9 million deaths and almost 13% of the population being eliminated. And that's one dictator wanting to replace the small farms of Ukraine and punish the independence mining Ukrainians that were posing that threat to the totalitarian authority. And I know that I think was one more thing that maybe people don't know enough about. And maybe you could share that before we get in to San Francisco in 1945. Yeah, I will just uh, tell you that I was surprised Maybe a week ago, I was walking on the street in San Francisco, and I heard the people, like um, local people, speaking between each other. Like about there were three of them, um, and uh, they were talking about Ukraine. And uh, one of them was explaining to, to the other ones about the. Did you hear about this thing called Lodomor? So the famine which exists, and people said no, and he was started telling them, and it was great that for me to hear that people, even who didn't think uh, heard anything about it before started to learn that, I don't know, maybe from television, maybe from reading something, but it's, it's a great thing that happened. But the historical context is such that uh, Russian government at that time, the Stalin, uh, wanted to have control over Ukraine. Well, they actually kind of did, but there was a strong Ukrainian resistance as always. And so they decided that they uh, need to make more control of our people and uh, make the population of Ukraine Last, and that was easy for them to do by uh, taking the harvest, the grain, the weeds that you people had, especially as a farmer, taking that from them and not allowing them to consume it themselves, and then basically leaving people to starve. And uh, the numbers uh, of people who died in 1932 33 uh, in Ukraine because of Holodomor, of this great famine, are actually much bigger. So these numbers. Uh, Vary from eight to ten million people, and there are some arguments about the exact number, but it's a lot. It, it's huge, uh, especially so. There was no war at that time. It was absolutely at a peaceful time, and uh, it has been brought to the to the world's attention by the uh, some U.S. Uh, writers and journalists uh, who brought it to the attention of the world because at that time there was the internet, there was no social media, so whatever Russia wanted to control and uh, does not. Uh, allow the information to go in the world, it could do that. And uh, you know that, again, we can connect it to the events right now, that Russia right now by uh, 
imposing a blockade on our seaports and not allowing Ukraine to trade, to send grain and wheat to the world uh, is basically creating another famine, another, uh, okay, maybe not famine, but at least a huge in food insecurity situation in the world. And the countries which are suffering, which might be suffering a lot from that are the Northern Africa, are some Middle Eastern countries and some other ones where Ukraine was a supplier for 30 or you know, 40% of the wheat or grain they consumed. So right now is again a huge effort uh, being taken by Ukraine together with international allies and also including Turkey with the, we hope with the United Nations and the World Food Program in order to um, introduce some instruments which would allow Ukraine to send the grain it has, which is already sitting in, on the, some ships uh, but who cannot leave the port or in the uh, grain storages to be sent to the countries which need them. And I was uh, just last week, I was participating in the Summit of Americas, uh, which happened in LA, and uh, almost all the small island states, small island countries were mentioning that this war, the Russia start against Ukraine, has already influence on them, even though it's too far. Uh, and the influence is because they already feel that the um, the food insecurity and the perspectives of this are even worse. That's why it's even very important to the global context because I know that some people think like, yeah, there is another war happening very far and it doesn't touch me directly. Well, it does already and it will eventually even more. And that's why we have to do everything possible to first to stop it and while it's still happening to, uh, to use international influence on Russia to let the uh, the grain and wheat and all the Ukrainian ships with food to leave to allow Ukraine to trade uh, in order to uh, to save the people to provide the help to the people who need it in the other parts of the world who do not have the the the, the earth uh, the soil which produced a lot of these uh, things that we produced and will produce in future. Those are excellent points, and it also connects it all together because the truth is, as you talked about the whole of Demar, it is true that uh, Ukraine has really been a breadbasket, sharing and exporting wheat to so many. And it gets back to the origin of the UN Charter. The idea in 1945 was never again. And the other aspect was Article 55 and 56, that if there's ever a situation where anyone's rights are denied, we all have a moral obligation to stand in solidarity together. Because if one conflict happens in one part of the world, the world understood in 1945, it ripples everywhere. And you're just illustrating now, if we can't solve this situation and connect the consequences, there'll be more and more uncertainty and instability around the world. And that's why we have to stand up of that right of self-determination and all human rights for all people. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And because um, you know, as you mentioned at the very beginning that um, in, in a couple of days, there will be a celebration of 77th anniversary of the uh, operation of United Nations here in San Francisco, which, uh, where I am located. Uh, we can now say that it's now clear that the goals set in San Francisco in 1945 during the creation of these global international security organizations have not been achieved. And it's impossible to achieve them uh, without the reform. Because uh, then therefore we must do everything possible in our power to pass on to the next generation and effective United Nations with the ability to respond preventively to security challenges and then thus guarantee the peace because peace, uh, establishing peace and preserving peace was the main objective of the United Nations. And if it fails to deliver this result, then as our president Zelensky says, maybe it, it should just stop existing. Maybe it should be replaced by a new organization with a different charter, a different way how to organization so the countries are cooperating. Because on one hand, we have the organization existing for 77 years, and it probably has provided uh, some help in many situations, but uh, in the main one, so to preserve peace, it, it failed. And not only in this case right now with the Russian war against Ukraine, but it has failed in many other ways. And that is because the, uh, coming back to the creation of this organization, it was basically created by winners of the Second World War. And those winners were uh, those who actually are permanent member of the Security Council. It's the United States, 
Soviet Union, uh, UK, France, and China. Maybe, by the way, France was not a huge winner, but it was, it was good that at least we, we have it there. Um, and uh, it happened that these five countries uh, have made the UN Charter in such a way that they can block any, any decision which the United Nations wants to take. Yeah, there is also General Assembly so we, where the members are almost 200 countries, but the main uh, decisions about the security uh, and war and peace are taken by the Security Council. And uh, this was the first time Ukraine felt that it's, the United Nations was not effective was in 2014 when Russia first attacked, when it actually invited Crimea and then made the annexation Crimea and occupying it now for eight years and then entered and attacked the Donbass. Uh, but at that time, Ukraine was not prepared for this war at all and we are we're not more prepared uh, right now. But nothing has changed. So no reforms have been taken. And uh, the idea right now is that, as our president says, we should reform the United Nations in such a way so that all states abide by international law, so that no one violates the world order. And uh, in the United Nations system, and in particular in the, the UN Security Council, uh, so that it would provide a fair representation for most nations of the world. And the voices of all entire regions should be heard, and which is vital. And uh, by allowing Russia to keep the right of veto power over any decisions, uh, we make this. We have the situation when it blocks any possible uh, resolution against itself. We also understand it's difficult uh, that the United States also has this veto power, and uh, sometimes it, it's important that it uses it. Uh, but probably those five permanent members should sacrifice their visa right and rearrange the or make reform to the uh, United Nations, at least in such a way that the, the country which is participating in the international dispute cannot vote and has not, like it actually kind of exists right now, but it just doesn't work, unfortunately. Oh, and that's why. Point. And uh, it's exciting because uh, we're talking about San Francisco, which was significant. And it's exciting you're posted there now because that's where for the first time it said every person everywhere on earth was born in dignity and rights. And so that was a significant step. But as you said, one of the, with the weaknesses was creating the Security Council with the veto. Another body that was created is right upstairs for me now. It is the UN Human Rights Council. And what was exciting was when Russia invaded this time, many people thought because it is a so-called superpower, nothing could be done. But the U.S. had just rejoined the Human Rights Council and one of its first acts on the council with all of the like-minded states who stand up for liberty consistently created a commission of inquiry on Russia and even had a special session at the Human Rights Council. So those reforms you're talking about need to happen, but it's exciting to see the Commission on Human Rights be able to transform to the Human Rights Council and make sure that even a large superpower who's violating the, the charter that was established in San Francisco could still be raised on those issues. And now a commission of inquiry working with to document all the human rights and international humanitarian law violations, as we're also near the International Committee on the Red Cross across the street. Right, absolutely. And uh, also, as you know, that Russia was finally expelled from the Human Rights Council. Yeah, probably maybe one of the first times it happened when a, a big power of the world has been expelled and Russia would not believe it, it is possible to do. But at least, yeah, it's important, but much more should be done and has to be done. And there is also one thing which exists in the United Nations. It's so-called uh, RFP, it's the responsibility to protect. And that means that whenever something, some, some injustice happens in the world, and this war is definitely injustice because this is unprovoked, absolutely war by Russia, that the countries, members of the United Nations have to unite and to act against these countries. But, and this is enough ground to act, but, but unfortunately the United Nations has done nothing to, to act. And we can also remind us an example when uh, even without the United Nations resolution, uh, the United States together with NATO countries, it has acted before in the 1990s when uh, Milosevic uh, in, in Yugoslavia was uh, killing, actually it was a slaughter or even maybe genocide 
of the uh, of the other peoples of former Yugoslavian Republic. And uh, in our understanding, the uh, United States together with the allies could help Ukraine more. And I'm not speaking it as a diplomat, I'm speaking on behalf of the Ukrainian people who like speak a lot about that because the people, no, regular people, they don't care about any, you know, what, what prevents the countries to help. They just need real help. And uh, we are grateful that we got the weapons from the United States, but we think that so much more can be done to restore justice because it's through Ukraine right now, but it could be other countries. And where are the countries? And uh, that's why this world order has to be more uh, just. Oh, we appreciate the calls for Zelensky using Ukraine as a model, but I also appreciate your sensitivity of what you're sharing today, because really every day of war means hundreds of lives are lost, lives of your country's best and brightest. And that's something that the right to protect and the other new examples that people are engaging in have to be done because every day we don't act, too many people die who are innocent, who've done nothing, who just want what the UN Charter was created to end the scourge of war. So I really appreciate you raising that point of what needs to be done and the urgency of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, well, there was one more thing I wanted to, to raise is that uh, Ukraine, uh, in, a, in a way, the reason of this war is because Ukraine uh, and Ukrainian people, they are part of Europe and they wanna be part of Europe. And Russia is an old time empire is, try, is trying to stop Ukraine and, and the people to choose their own future and to being a, a part of Europe. That's what's happening in 2014, that's happening right now. And the result that we have is that today, uh, the European Commission um, has approved the decision that Ukraine is becoming a candidate to join the European Union. Uh, that's not, of course, yet the membership, but it's the status of the uh, candidate of European Union, the one which Ukraine was aspiring for for many years, to be honest. And uh, right now, this is uh, the gesture that the European Union, the countries of the European Union, has provided to Ukraine. It's very important, and it and it gives like an inspiration for people in Ukraine, for the for those who are fighting against Russia, that they have this perspective for their children. So they will have a future which is different from old Russia and from all of that. And that's why they will have inspiration to fight for the independence of Ukraine and for the right of Ukraine to choose uh, the future where it belongs. No, those are great points. And it's building on just the visit of German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and French President Emmanuel Macron, as well as the Italian prime minister. And that's what's so important because now at least it sets up, as you said, complying with the Copenhagen criteria, and then moving forward to make sure that, as Zelensky often says, they're fighting for European and really universal values such as human rights and rule of law, inclusive democracy, where everyone can have their rights respected and protected. So that's quite crucial as we move forward. And I, like you said, it's a new chapter in a way building on the legacy of the UN Charter, but really looking at important aspects of regional cooperation and how we can go forward. Yeah, absolutely, you're right. And um, that's why, uh, yeah, by the way, it's not only Ukraine today, I think Moldova has gotten this uh, status, which is also uh, absolutely right thing to do because uh, they're our neighbors and they also have problem with Russia because part of the Moldova territory, this Transnistria region has been occupied by Russian forces since 1990. And uh, they are also threatening Ukraine from the Western side. Uh, and uh, if being kind of together in this uh, means that with those countries, Ukraine and Moldova and the other ones have, um, we have just a different historical trajectory of development. And when this war stops and we believe it should start soon, we'll, a lot of rebuilding efforts will be needed, but then there will be a different, I mean, a new nation of Ukrainian people who are, who will be like, who are example of resistance for the freedom in the world right now. Uh, but they will be member of a new world where such things as uh, war should not exist.
That's a beautiful point. And it's also great to see how inspiring it is for the Ukrainian people to stand up. We now even see Russian journalist Dmitry Muratov. He auctioned off his Nobel Peace Prize medal just on Monday this week for a stunning 1.3.5 million. And the funds are going straight to UNICEF to provide aid for Ukrainian children. And he, of course, with the Novoya Gazeta, was an independent publication. And he's fighting for those human rights you're talking about inside Russia so that Russia could then not be able to take out its actions against neighbors. So it's an important part of if you have human rights in the country and democracy, then governments can't take actions lying to their own people. And this is one aspect of solidarity where everyone's realizing these basic rights bring us all together. And those were enshrined for the first time in San Francisco where you're, you're based now. Absolutely, yeah. We just need more people like him in Russia to do such things and to demonstrate to the world that not everyone there supports the war, because there are a lot of people there, to be honest, but not everyone. And uh, these examples are, are bright. Those are needed to the world. And this should show to the people in Russia that you have to not, you cannot allow the, the Putin to rule you anymore and uh, have like continue to wage this war. You have to stop it. It's true. And then you also brought up some good points about the major reforms in the UN, that while we're celebrating the 77th anniversary and there hasn't been a world war, there are attempts such as the right to protect. Also, the initiative by the countries to focus on the use of the veto and have to defend that right. That was an initiative by one of the members recently. But I think Zelensky's call for standing up for these international order rooted in law is absolutely essential as we move forward. And hopefully by the 78th or the 80th session that we celebrate in San Francisco together, we would see those important changes in the international institutions of the UN. Yeah, exactly. So there can be different uh, scenarios of this reform, like including more countries as the permanent members, uh, like, I don't know, Germany, uh, Turkey, uh, and Korea, and many, uh, many other countries who deserve to be, like Brazil, for example, right? who are actually like key players in the world. And also just to, 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 to change the way how the way veto power is used or just take this veto power away from those who are participants of the international uh, military dispute. And that will create the possibility for United Nations to take decisions and to act and to finally preserve the peace, the, the purpose which it was created for in 1945 here in San Francisco. Thank you so much. And we can all appreciate the spirit of San Francisco, of the UN Charter, that for the first time, for seven spaces in that UN Charter, it talked about the rights of all people and the right of self determination, and that we can continue that spirit today and make sure that it's not extinguished in Ukraine and that the wonderful people standing up throughout the world and inspired by the people of Ukraine can demand dignity and equality for all. Thank you for joining me. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great conversation. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.